The podcast you're about to hear involves true stories, which may contain graphic content that is not suitable for children. Listener's discretion is advised. This is Esoteric Oddities. Hey, guys. Hey, guys. I had a really shitty day at work. Oh, we can tell. Hey, guys. Right. Okay. Like, what the fuck is that? Where's the excitement? Anyway, um, so I got moved locations because um, my location is being renovated. So, of course, I'm on the 13th floor, and we all know how um, unlucky the number 13 is. So, thir- lucky, lucky floor number 13. Huh? Unlucky floor number 13. So, I did some research um, to find out why it's so unlucky. So, I found that... Um, Researchers estimate that at least 10% of the U.S. population has a fear of the number 13. Each year, the even more specific fear of Friday the 13th. Um, known as something with a P, but I'm not going to try. It's a phobia. Paraskeptophobia? I like it. Thanks. Uh, people avoid marrying, traveling, or um, even working on those days i'm sorry i can't come into work it's the 13th (laughs) friday the 13th um so uh mathematicians and scientists point to the number 12 often considered as the perfect number in the ancient world the ancient sumerians developed a number system based on the use of 12 that is still used um you know to measure time calendars have 12 months a single day is um 12 hours long which is a half day your eyes are red. Are you high? No. Um, <laughs> I swear Jason farted on my pillow. He claims not. Uh, um, so ancient Norse lord holds um, evil and turmoil uh, were first introduced in the world by the appearance of the treacherous god Loki and a dinner party. Um, he was the thirteenth. He was the thirteenth guest, and um, he upset the balance of twelve gods that was already in attendance. So, according to the Stress Management Center and Phobia Institution in North Carolina, that sounds like an th- awful place to fucking work. I am saying, more than eighty percent of high-rise buildings in the United States do not have a thirteenth floor, and the vast majority, uh, and the majority of hotels. Hospitals and airports avoid using the number 13. Even though, so technically the 14th floor would then be a 13th, but they just don't label it as such. So how's work going on the 13th floor? Because clearly your building didn't give a fuck about 13. (laughs) You're really high up. It's an amazing view. It really is. But, um. A less than amazing time. Yes. Understood. Very unfulfilling. But you know what was fulfilling? What? Was... Um, when we went to that comedy show together, that was so funny. I was dying. I don't know if you heard me. I was oh my really god, you laughing. had those. You were that girl in the audience with the loud clap. <laughs> Lots of that. <laughs> Loved that. <laughs> we saw um Corinne Fisher and Christina Hutchinson from the Guys We Fucked podcast. So good, guys. Yeah. Make us famous. We're here. Hey. No, don't make us famous. My nudes are gonna leak. Um. Wait. Huh? <clears throat> Um, so this is really TMI, and um, people We're on already that know level. that I like shit on the side of the road. Okay. So just like, letting you know, I I did edit that part out, and you just kind of blew your cover on that. No, I'm just kidding. I left it. I in. know you did because I heard it. Of course, I'm gonna fucking leave that in. That's gold. <laughs> okay, so I know y'all have like I call it the shadow thing in your asshole. So like email us. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what I'm talking about? Like, <laughs> no. when, when the skin no. surrounding your asshole is, like, dark. Oh, I thought you were talking about, like, the sh- like a shadow puppet, like, a no, ghost in my asshole. No, I'm talking about prairie dogging. Oh, my God. I'm talking about legit, like, I've seen it in porn. And I thought I thought these girls had dirty assholes. But is that why people bleach their buttholes? Like, or is it for the hair? Like, I need to know. I think so. I was looking up. Um, it's I was, I actually told Siri, I was like, Siri, Google anal bleach cafe near me. And it sent it in a group text to my brother and my two cousins. And I was like, oops, sorry. I mean, it's fine. Told Siri to Google that. Um, But that sounds good. Like a nice little anal bleach and a, um, and a coffee. Like, but I just need to know, like, what is it for? for I feel like I've, I feel like I've asked this questions a hundred and one times. Because no one talks about the shadow thing. It's, (laughs) (laughs) it's, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what else to call we it. We need to raise awareness like, for your asshole shadow. Why does it look like that? I honestly, I don't think I know what you're talking about. Okay, I'm going to show you. Please, Sarah, keep your pants on. 
No, 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 no. What the fuck? That's is somebody that? who sat on like an electrical box and the electrical box oh, blew no, up. He stuck a firecracker in his asshole. I don't like the way this looks. <clears throat> oh, baby. Gotta give my liver a break. Ay, 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 ay. That is the hit song from our album. Um, raise awareness for that shadow thing in the asshole. Uh, it will be on shelves at Best Buy and Sam Goody in 2010. Uh, but I've been making these vegan rice paper things, and they're really fucking good. Do you know the rice paper things I'm talking about? They got them at Wegmans. It's like, uh, it kind of looks like a condom. I don't know how else oh, to explain it, was, it. Like the summer rolls. Yeah, they're like they're translucent. Yeah, mm-hmm. I've been making those. They're so good. Just uh, just letting you guys know. Are you still looking up that asshole picture? I need to show you what I mean. I don't want to see you just show me a firecracker up someone's asshole. I don't think I need to see anything else. Our topic for today, uh, speaking of firecrackers up the ass, is freak accidents. Was that an accident, though? He clearly purposely put a firecracker freak, in his ass. Freak, freak. Um, I have a um, a little story to cover. Okay. That's not one of your stories that you did? No. Oh, okay. All right. So uh, hit me with it. Okay. There was a case in my hometown. Um, this guy from high school I knew burned in a house. And everyone was like, well, like, why is he there? Like, I don't understand what's going on. So basically, um, it came to be that the guy that owned the house wanted to destroy it for insurance money. They were supposedly supposed to get like... Um, eight hundred thousand dollars so he um you know got with this guy they were friends and he was like help me burn my house down the guy who was living in there yeah so um the guy i know from high school got his dad involved so it was these three people you know the guy from high school his friend and then his dad right um so something happened and Instead of a fire, it was an explosion and he didn't make it oh, but Jesus. um they have like they have phone records of him calling his dad back and forth and when the fire started his dad left so he got charged with his murder oh the dad did mm-hmm. oh fuck right crazy shit happens in the um scranton uh, Pennsylvania. electric city baby oh, i'm electric woogie, woogie, woogie. i need to fill this turtle tank because it's gonna keep sounding like someone's ripping asshole so give me a second rip rip <laughs> can you just keep this in there Speaking of freak accidents, the only one that I kind of am somewhat close to is my mom's good friend. And they were really good friends like when I was younger and they're still good friends now. Um, Her son got electrocuted when he was doing work at the mall. And I was working there when it happened. Yikes. Yeah, he got like full on electrocuted and like the power in the entire mall went out and he died. Oh my God. That's I know. So sad. I know. It's really sad. On a lighter note, the one movie that reminds me the most of um, Freak Accidents was Final Destination. Have you heard of it? We all know. I actually did one of my stories about a log. Ah, uh, no. Fuck out of here. I will Fuck never. out of here. I will never drive behind a truck that has logs on Same. it. Same. I'm like, nope, nope. Get out. I will never let my friends put their feet on the, it's true. He on the dashboard. I'm you. But that's not a freak accident, and that's not because of that movie. That's because of Death Proof. If you've ever seen it, look up Death Proof accident scene, and you and your friends will never want to put your feet up on like a dashboard or a window ever again. Uh, just just a heads up. Trigger warning. Um, who goes first? Me. I think you do. You have like four, right? Should we just do one or the other? Back and forth. Well, you only have two. Yeah. So I'll do two. You go, and then I'll do my last. Yeah. All of mine kind of surround actors and freak accidents that happen with actors. I love that. We're just making so much fucking noise. Oh, you just I'm kicked sorry. me so fucking aggressive. Sorry. So my first one is about Dan Hovels. So in 2008, Dan Hovels, a Swedish-born German theater actor, portrayed the complex role of Mortimer in Frederick Schiller's play, Mary Stuart. So the play depicts the last days of Mary, Queen of Scots, where Mary Stuart is imprisoned in England for the murder of her husband. So for actor Dan Hovel, everything was going according to plan up until the final scene of the play, when his character has an onstage suicide. 
So just like every other night he performed the role of Mortimer, Hovel took the prop straight razor and slashed his throat and waited for the fake blood to pump. But baby, this night, no fake blood was needed. Zero to one hundred. As someone had replaced the prop blade with a real one. The 30-year-old actor slumped over with blood pouring from his neck while the audience broke into applause at the special effect. It was only when he did not get up for curtain call that people realized that something had gone wrong. Though bleeding profusely, Hovel survived because the knife missed his carotid artery and when he sliced his neck. Wolfgang Lenz, the doctor who treated him, said, "'Just a little bit deeper and he would have been drowning in his own blood.'" One officer told the Austrian news, um, the rumors are wild, with some claiming he was victim of a jealous rival, but we don't know anything for sure. We have to work through everyone. Uh, The self-inflicted injury needed two stitches. Police began investigating to find out whether the knife swab was a horrible mistake or a murder plot. They questioned the rest of the cast and the uh, the backstage hands who had access to the props. So after emergency treatment at the hospital, Hovel declared that the show must go on. What a fucking guy. And he, what a re- guy. he returned to stage Sunday night with a bandage tied around his neck, ready once again to meet his mock demise. As I was doing research for this, I slipped a knife slipped and I slipped my thumb. Love that. I was cutting a tomato. Red flag. Mm. Uh huh. Uh, that's terrifying. Just having like. That's like that scene in... Um, I would never do that again. I would not... Like, 1010 would not recommend. Because what if someone does it again? And again, and again. That's like in Scream. And, um, yeah, was it just Scream, I think? Or was it I Know What You Did Last Summer? Where she's... Both. I think it was Scream. And I then Scary it. Movie. Because I know Scary Movie made fun of it. But um, when she's on stage... Well, I guess that's totally not the same thing. Never mind. Well, <laughs> it's similar because she was oh. seeing her boyfriend oh, right, or whoever right, right. getting killed by um, Ghostface and she's screaming on stage and everybody's that's like... That's what Scream is called? What? Ghostface? Yeah. Oh. And everybody's like applauding her and they're just like, wow, great acting. And she's yes. like, someone nice. help. Right. And they're just like, yes, bitch. Yeah, girl, go. Uh, what, a, what a classic. But like... It's probably someone who didn't get the part and they're just going to keep sabotaging the play until it's them. You know that Scream's a movie that already came out and that's not the plot of it, right? I'm talking about your story. Oh. oh. <laughs> I'm rolling my fucking eyes. Oh my God. Um, so they, this was in 2008 and the outcome of it was basically just that it was an accident. How? They, they can't really, there's no proof. There was of no videos. there's no So it could have been. But uh, straight razors are pretty fucking sharp. Ever seen Sweeney Todd, my dude? Sweeney, Sweeney. Mine are like really, of course they are. Mine are just regular ones. Reg- just regular old ones. All right. Well, because I like things that are like, it could happen to anybody. Because I feel like it makes it more scary. Life is fucking scary. <laughs> it sure fucking is. Being an adult is scary. I'm going to be 26 in five days. What the fuck do I have to show for it? Your tits. That's true. So my next story is about Vic Morrow. Uh, so Victor Morrow was born Victor Morozov in the New York City borough of the Bronx to a middle-class Jewish family. He dropped out of high school when he was 17 and enlisted in the United States Navy. He later left the Navy in pursuit of acting. So Morrow attracted attention while he was playing Stanley in, in a touring production of A Streetcar Named Desire. Never seen it. Never heard of it. But it's there. So he was scouted and eventually uh, landed his first movie role in 1955 in a film titled Blackboard Jungle. He played a thug student uh, in the social commentary film about teachers in an interracial inner city school. So his role opened doors for him and soon he was acting alongside Elvis Presley. Just three years later in uh, the 1958 film King Creole. So he appeared in over 65 movies and television shows between 1955 and 1983, including Hawaii Five O, Alfred Hitchcock Presents, The Untouchables, and Charlie's Angels. In 1983, he was cast as Bill Connor in his last film, Twilight Zone, the movie. Bum, bum, bum. Of course it's Twilight Zone. <clears throat> So, while filming the movie, everything went fine until the final day of shooting. 
During a Vietnam War battle scene, Morrow and two Vietnamese children were supposed to be running from a pursuing helicopter. Special effects exploded on the set and caused the helicopter's tail rotor to blow off, causing the pilot of the low-flying craft to lose control. The helicopter's blades decapitated both Vic Morrow and seven-year-old actor Mika Din Lee. The helicopter itself then crashed to the ground, crushing and killing another child actor, six-year-old Renee Shin Yi Chen. That's fucked. So when this case was brought to court, it was noted that Vic Morrow was carrying the two children in his arms while standing in knee-deep water uh, as the helicopter which had been hovering about 24 feet above him, began to spin out of control. Uh, In 1987, the 40-year-old helicopter pilot, Dorsey Wingo, uh, testified in court that he is distraught to this day that actor Vic Morrow did not try to evade the plummeting aircraft in the five seconds it would have taken him to get out of the way, Um, which, you know, then he ended up striking and killing him and the two other children. He says, quote, It extremely distresses me to the max that he never looked up. Wingo said, emotionally, in the midst of the caustic round of (laughs) cross-contamination. You got this. Uh, Cross-contamination. Girl, get yourself a Clorox wipe, bleach your asshole, and fight the cross-contamination. Thanks. Uh, You you, um, answered my problem. So Wingo had said that emotionally in the midst of a caustic round of cross-examination led by prosecutor in the involuntary manslaughter trial, uh, Deputy District Attorney Leah D'Agostino. So then she asked, so where did you like expect this dude to run? So then Wingo replied, away from the helicopter. So then Wingo pretty much goes into the story about how he had previously instructed Morrow to take precaution if the sound coming from the helicopter changed considerably, which I guess happens when it fucking goes out of control. So Wingo also says he had five seconds between the time that the sound of the helicopter changed and that of the impact. And I would hope to God that he would have used those five seconds to escape. Outside the courtroom later, Wingo explained that he is not trying to cast any blame on Morrow for the 1980s film set tragedy sounds a lot like you kind of are mr wingo dingo um which occurred after a fireball from the special effects exploded and like i said before had damaged the helicopter's tail rotor uh he says i'm certainly not blaming vic morrow it distresses was that you oh shit that was a turtle uh it distresses me that he did not look up to the helicopter as i asked him to and it's something i will never forget Asked if Morrow could have evaded the lethal swath of the helicopter's main rotor blade, which had a diameter of 44 feet, Uh, Wingo told reporters, I have a secret place in my heart that says he would have been able to do something. There's nothing easy about living with this. Nothing. But it is one of the small, very small comforts I have in dealing with it. So he's pretty much just saying that he's not fucking taking fault for it well he should also i would never i i just feel like these people pick bad situations like i would be cautious about a helicopter also i don't think it's his fault 100 percent. it's not 100 percent, but it's just like you had like it played a small part you could just say that no well i don't know because i don't know if it was that he was flying too close because if he was flying too close to it and he consciously knew that then it would be his fault but if if he was if he if that helicopter he was flying hit his mark where he was supposed to be at that time and it was somebody who was setting off the explosives that didn't hit their mark and they did it too early or did it too late then it would be their fault not the helicopter pilot's fault because he was doing everything he was instructed to do because it's a job for him like they're this is hollywood everybody's acting everybody's working do you know what i mean so like nobody meant for this shit to happen um the hills were working when they revealed it was a fucking set I still have trust issues. Please don't bring it up. Hillary Duff plays gently in the background. Oh, no, it was Natasha Bedingfield. Hil- yeah. Hillary, Hillary, <laughs> Hillary, are you there? <laughs> Hillary Duff was in um, Laguna Beach. Let the rain fall down and wick my dreams. Let it wash away my shadow butthole. 
<laughs> maybe that's all you really need. Maybe it's just you. Maybe you just need to wash your asshole. No, I've seen it in porn. Oh. Okay. They have like their assholes have sh- like it's like like brown ring asshole. No. So let's get back to this helicopter crash. <laughs> Take it away, crash hole. <laughs> I hate it. Okay, so um, bu- 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 bu. so then the district ator- attorney who um, she said outside of the courtroom that she found Wingo's testimony quite amazing, saying it sounded like Wingo was blaming Morrow, uh, and the prosecutor declared, "How could he have possibly thought that Vic Morrow have could have done anything to escape that helicopter under those circumstances and conditions. It's a classic example of defense. They're blaming the parents. They're blaming the fire safety officers. They're blaming everyone. And now they're blaming a dead man. It's incredible. So Twilight Zone co-director John Landis and four other men working on the film, including special effects coordinator and the helicopter pilot Dorsey Wingo, were charged with involuntary manslaughter. According to a 1987 New York Times report, it was the first time a film director faced a criminal charge for events that occurred while making a movie. During the subsequent trial, the defense maintained that the crash was an accident and could have not been predicted, while the prosecution claimed that Landis, who was the director, and his crew had been reckless and violating laws regarding child actors, including regulations about their working conditions and hours. Which, uh, maybe in the 70s, but nowadays, everything I've been on has been, unless it's like a student film. Nowadays. Uh, they really crack down on those hours, which is a good thing. Uh, so the families of all three victims filed lawsuits against Landis, Warner Brothers, and Twilight Zone co-director and producer Steven Spielberg that were settled for an undisclosed amount. Um, Twilight Zone, the movie, was then released in the midsummer of 1983. Wow. So, so far we've got a slit throat and a decapitated head. Okay, mine are more natural. Okay, I like a, like a rocks falling from yeah. the sky. Yeah, kind of. So, um, 50-year-old Olga Perkovic and her three children and her mother were enjoying a ski vacation at a popular resort on the south side of Lake, Lake Tahoe. I've always wanted to go there. Me too. Um, the mother and her son were returning from an afternoon ski run on the slopes when tragedy hit. They were last seen alive boarding a ski lift at 4 p.m. and were reported missing at 6.40 p.m. when they failed to return to their condo when it started getting dark. So, you know, a search was called and their bodies were found. So, oh my God, can I guess? Yeah. No, I'm not going to guess. Well, I was going to say, did the ski lift break down? No. Okay. I'm glad you didn't get it right away because I was like, wow, this is probably like really, really telling. <laughs> um, at approximately 9 p.m., a neighbor of the missing people noticed ski gloves on the snow along the side of their condo. The neighbor investigated the ski gloves and realized the... Um, there was a hand attached. Yeah. So the missing people, no. Oh. Uh, were laying buried beneath the snow. So... Um, Olga and her son, Aaron Goldstein, were discovered unconscious under a mound of snow more than two hours after they were reported missing. The neighbor spotted the ski glove sticking to the snow outside of the condo, and that's when they were found. So, uh, rescuers ran to the scene. They dug them out. Uh, they were flown to an emergency helicopter to separate hospitals, and they later passed away. Aaron Goldstein was a first grader at the French American, oh, right? no, I thought he was going to be like, I thought it was like a college student, which uh-uh. still fucking sucks, but no. Right. He was a first grader at the French American International School in San Francisco. Um, the deaths came after the biggest snowstorm of the year hit over the weekend. Um, it snowed six feet. Jesus Christ. An avalanche at a nearby uh, Valley Ski Resort buried five people and sent two to the hospital. With non-threatening injuries. Oh, hell no. The Uh, avalanche occurred a day after a 42-year-old snowboarder died during a blizzard. Hold it. So an avalanche killed them? Like it's probably a smaller one maybe? Yeah. So an avalanche killed like a bunch of people in the surrounding area. But these were the ones reported. So it was um, the mother and son. And then the avalanche happened. 
Okay. And then it was um, five people. Two got sent to the hospital, and they were okay. And then a snowboarder passed away during a blizzard. No, thanks. I'll stay in the cabin and drink my fucking cocoa. Because that's what happened. When I was younger, I used to go um, skiing, which is funny because it was when I used to live in a place that didn't have hills. We used to have to travel to Wisconsin, like up the Wisconsin Dells. That's funny you said that. Or were we in Michigan? Michigan? I think we were in Wisconsin. We would travel to Wisconsin when I lived in um, Chicago. And we would go, and this was when I was younger, younger. And we would go skiing and I would do all the shit. Um, so I was like, you know what? Let's go skiing for my birthday again. So we go like, I want to say it was like my... It's in February, your birthday. Yeah, I want to say it was my 18th February birthday. February 13th. It's not the 13th. I know, I always say that. I want it to be. You bitch. So we go again and I was probably maybe 18. It might have been my 18th birthday. No, there's no, it was my 18th birthday. I don't be older than that. Maybe it was my 19th or 20th. I don't know. Any huevos. We go out there. I go up. There's so many fucking people. And I go to ski down there and I have confidence in myself, but there's so many fucking kids just going all over the place that I literally take off my skis. (laughs) I take off my skis, I sit on top of them, and I ride down the side of the mountain where nobody is really skiing, and I know I'm, like, in a safe place. Yeah, but all these fuck, like, all these kids, nobody's gonna get out of your way. I almost went into, like, the asphalt and tripped on somebody, and, um, yeah, and I didn't feel like getting up on a sketchy fucking ski lift, because I've seen a movie where the ski lift breaks, and the kids are stuck up there. Also, there's another movie where they're in a car and there's an avalanche and all the kids are stuck in the car. What would you do? I would like crack open a window and breathe on it. Breathe on the window? Yeah, it would melt everything because I have such hot breath. <laughs> That's what they call me, Johnny Hot Breath. Um. What do you, oh, you could lay on the horn. The horn doesn't use your battery, right? Because so, it's. I'm pretty sure it's something else. Are you, we talking? We're stuck in the car. We're stuck in a car. We're I would under break an avalanche. The window. That's I. Oh, we're I under hope, an avalanche. I hope to God I'm not stuck in a car with you when you do that. One, two, two. Can your legs reach, sweetie? Wow. Why are you coming for me? Because I'm dead ass. Can your legs reach? Like where? Your legs can't reach to so your. If you're sitting in there and you're trying to kick up into the windshield, sorry, homie. Uh, yes, they can. We can make that happen. I'll yeah, bust your windows out right now. I'll show you. Maybe with a booster seat. No, I'll literally. Don't kick my mini fridge. All you have to do. She's is gonna kick my. She's this. demonstrating. Yeah, but if you're close enough. Oh, I those shoes are close. cute. Thanks. Everyone compliments me on them. I would be close. What do you think? I'd be all the way over there trying to kick this window out. All flat. right. Okay. So, but why that's a bad idea is that all the snow's just gonna come I in and fucking suffocate us. That. Okay. So well, scenario number two, what do we do? Um, you said you were o- you would open a window. How no, not that? open a window, but crack open a window. Yeah, how is that any better? You just do like a little crack and you try to finger your way out. Yeah. And then maybe we get lightheaded and fucking pass out from the fumes. And maybe die and it'll be a fucking miracle. I don't know. I haven't seen the movie, so I don't even know if I get out or not. Uh, well. Can you guys let us know what you would do? I would die. In the so. case of an avalanche, if you're stuck in a car and the car is completely submerged in snow. I haven't seen the fucking movie, so I don't know what happened and how they got. I would drive away first off. But maybe that wasn't um, an option for them. Who knows? Those turtles. Aggressive. They need something. They need some milk. Your turn again. All right, here I go. Dude, we should do another. I think it was our second episode that we ta- we did like nature's fucking terrifying. Because they were really in. Yeah, and I did the volcano and you did. What did you did? Oh, we should do that again. Nature's fucking scary, y'all. Yeah, it is. Um, just the world is scary. Um, so Aurora Schiefel, she was a 14-year-old cheerleader. Um, she was with her two friends visiting the uh, South Jetty Park Beach in Brandon, Oregon um, on spring break. <clears throat> the tide was receding and the group of them stood on a log near the ocean's edge um, around 4 p.m. And it's an unexpected swell of the ocean water known as the sneaker wave surged up. Do you know what that is? It sneaks up on you. I'm. It's a sneaker. Sneaker. Um, Aurora's friends jumped off the log and escaped, and um, Aurora was kicked off the log and pinned beneath it. 
I'm having a really hard time picturing this. So, um, imagine the log. It's like a a plethora of logs. Okay. And she tried to jump, and she landed underneath it, so she probably lo- rolled. And oh. because that one moved, everything else moved. Oh, You know no. what I mean? But she's underwater? No, she's just under these logs. Oh, okay. But the the sneaker wave made them move. Oh, 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 oh. oh. Probably, like, lifted them up. hmm And then S- dropped them back down. Okay. Right. So, um, bystanders uh, were able to free Aurora, um, and they called <clears throat> the ambulance for help. Um, but despite this, Aurora died shortly after arriving to the hospital. Oh, my God. What the fuck? hmm So, since 2000, uh, sneaker waves have killed 17 people along the, or- the Oregon coast. When the waves um, dis- distribute fallen logs near the waterline, it, like, kicks out everything else. So, like, imagine dominoes. Yeah, no, I, I get that. Sneak a sneak away. Wait, I'm going to watch a video of it so I can get a full visual. Okay. Okay, so what I'm seeing right now, it says, A beach a few miles south of Cape Perpetua. Wow, that sounds dangerous. Was about to become a very dangerous place. Sneaker wave. <laughs> Uh, and right now it just looks like a calm beach with a very low tide. The water is out. There's some sand. In less than one minute, the beach was overrun by a sneaker wave. Still waiting on this sneaker wave. Oh, there. Yep, there she is. Okay, now the water is rushing up. Mm-hmm. Okay, now it's on the beach. Okay, the guy with the camera is freaking out. He's running. Dude, you got to run a little bit faster than that. Right, isn't it crazy? Oh, shit. He's running. Run, homie. Oh, I think I'm shit. watching the same one you are. He's Look running into go. trees. Where's that little girl with her dog? What happened to her? I wish I knew. Hey, guys, this is a new podcast where, again, we're just going to continue um, describing the things that we're seeing that you can't see. It says, I'm snickering to myself. This was a really dumb idea to shoot video while on the beach. I don't think he speaks English. All right. Uh, well, that's sad. Look out for those sneaker waves. They'll get you. They got Aurora. Wow. Right? She was from um, Eugene, Oregon. I think it's Oregon. 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 Well, why is it? Origami. Okay. Have you ever been to Portland, Origami? Is Portland in Oregon? Yes. That's where all the hipsters go. Did you check to make sure your middle finger was up? I think so. She just gave me the finger and then like double check to make sure it was the right I'm, one. I'm like delusional right now. <laughs> uh well, let's head on over to uh, Tinseltown. Ah, uh, yes, <laughs> Hollywood. Let's filled head with, over to Tinseltown. Filled with stars, bottle blondes, and occasional murder. We're not talking about murder. We're talking about um, accidents. So this is Eric Fleming. This shit. Okay, get ready for this shit. So on the 4th of July, 1925, Eric Fleming was born in St. Paula, California. Born with a club foot, he needed crutches to get around, and he was an easy target for his abusive father, um, who would beat him severely. At the age of eight, he attempted to kill his father with a gun, but the gun jammed and his dad beat the shit out of him. So he ran away from home. He fleed to Los Angeles and then he went to Chicago. Um, where he was roughly associated with gangsters to do odd jobs for them for money. Money, honey. And when I say he fled at the age of eight, homeboy fled at the age of eight and he got into dealing with like mobsters by the age of 11 so at the age of 11 he was wounded in a gunfight between some gangsters he was hospitalized uh when he was returned home to his mother his dad was gone uh they had divorced uh and during the depression he dropped out of school and he worked various jobs uh before he joined the merchant marine before then joining the u.s navy in 1942 for world war ii where he served as a CB in the naval construction. Construction. <laughs> um, so Eric received severe facial injuries during a bet when he attempted to lift a 200 pound weight, which came crashing down on his face. 
So he had to undergo extensive plastic surgery to reconstruct his forehead, nose, and jaw. Before this, Fleming had always thought of himself to be ugly and considered this incident to be a wonderful balance of values because after his surgery, he actually looked a lot better. Look at that. It's a win-win. So maybe I just need a 200-pound barbell to drop on my face. Okay, sign me up. So after his facial reconstruction, he returned to Paramount Studios, where he was working as a construction worker, a grip, and a carpenter. A man of many trades. Uh, Good luck just showing up and working as a grip nowadays. He made a bet with another actor that he could do a better audition. Well, bitch, he lost the bet. It cost him $100. And upon deciding that acting had cost him $100, he said acting would get it back. By that, I mean, who knows? Because he paid more money because he entered uh, acting classes at studios in the evenings. So Look at that. See? He ended up making a, de- a debut in a 1944 training film. He did stage work in Chicago and New York. And in 1951, he starred on a Dumont TV network kitty series major del conway of the flying tigers while his hollywood film roles were largely confined um to standard he man heroics he uh actually then could get like you know a a wider variety of acting gigs um after exhibiting his singing and dancing skills in the 1955 broadway play plain and fancy (laughs) now that is what they called me in high school (laughs) Uh, So anyway, uh, in 1959, he was cast as trial boss Gil Favor in Rawhide, one of the most popular TV Western series of the era. Uh, Feeling that he had been upstaged by his younger co-star, Clint Eastwood, Fleming left Rawhide in 1966 to seek out a film to work on. At the age of 41, he played a secondary role to Doris Day in the comedy The Glass Bottom Boat. The Glass Bottom Beat, excuse me. You'll see why I said The Glass Bottom Boat in a hot second. Glass Bottom Boat, oh. Oh, it is Glass Bottom Boat. I made a typo earlier. Look at look at that. Doing things. Fucking up, but catching myself in the process. 2012. Still We're got, doing great. Still got time to make those New Year's resolutions come true, baby. So, um, yeah, so the, the film was The Glass Bottom Boat. He headed after that to Peru to film the pilot episode of a TV adventure series called High Jungle. But it was a TV show he would never get to see. So during a scene in the final stages of the film's production, seems interesting, right? Final stages, the final scene, slit the throat, the final scene filming, got decapitated, the final stages of the film's production. So this guy, Eric, and a co-star, Nico uh, Min- Minardos, sure, uh, they were in a dugout canoe that was overturned in the Huallaga River. Uh, Nico managed to swim to safety, but Eric Fleming was swept away by the current, drowned, and eaten by piranhas. Oh, this escalated quickly. Sure did. Uh, On September 28th, 1966, his severely mutilated remains were not recovered until four days later. So, Is everyone uh, good over there? They were literally like filming. Well, this wasn't in Hollywood. It was a Hollywood production, but it was in Peru. Hollywood production. Freak accidents. We should. We could literally talk about anything on A Thousand Ways to Die. Literally. Though. That show was like about freak accidents. Now, I don't know how true they are. They give the dates and the nicknames and shit, and they claim that it's all true, but I ain't buying a lot of that shit. But highly recommend. That's a great show. I think it was on Spike. Not sponsored. But what's up? Was it on Spike? I think so. Because um, b- um, Bar Rescue is on Spike. I loved Bar Rescue. Holy cannoli. That was a really great show. I went to the Bar Rescue bar in Louisiana. And the floor... When were you there? Last August. Literally a year ago. Probably today. <laughs> I was in New Orleans. Oh. Where were you? <laughs> the floor was very sticky. I literally could not. Did you see the movie Piranhas? No. Mm-mm. Is that for with Jayla? No, that was Anaconda. Oh, nope. Piranha. I th- I'm pretty sure I watched it. Um, I want to say it was with... Who the fuck was in that? I think it's a movie that I watched somewhat recently, but my brain just automatically was like, you know what? This is not useful information. Oh, oh my God. Eli Roth is in it. And he like he dies by a piranha. He gets like cut in half by I'm a boat. A piranha. Oh, good time. 
Dude, piranhas, what the fuck is going on in the ocean, y'all? Everybody wants it's to know right, why I'm scared. Isn't it 80% like undiscovered? I think it's more than that. Yeah. Um, and maybe it should stay that way. I am saying stop going down there. Like y'all stay on the wet side, we'll stay on the dry side. Fucking trying to aerial this shit. Uh Oh, you're done, aren't you? It's my turn again. Yeah, wait. Yeah, this is my final story. Oh, yeah. So now the moment we have all been waiting for. Or just me. This was the story that um, I wanted to do as my main topic, but then I got fascinated by everything else. Uh, So this is the death of Brandon Lee. So in 1993, Entertainment Weekly actually had written a nice article titled uh, The Brief Life and Unnecessary Death of Brandon Lee. Uh, You know who he is, right? Bruce Lee's son. Okay, so Brandon Lee was born February 1st, 1965 in Oakland, California. He was the son of famous, famous, famous martial arts star Bruce Lee. He spent most of his early years in Hong Kong. Sadly, Lee lost his father when he was only eight years old. Bruce Lee died of cerebral edema which was a buildup of fluid in the brain, in Hong Kong under mysterious circumstances. It was rumored that the Chinese mafia had him killed because, um, as a punishment because Bruce Lee had exposed the ancient martial arts secrets on film. Uh, after his father's death, Brandon moved to Seattle with his mother and his sister. Brandon struggled growing up, moving around a lot, and coping with uh, being the son of a martial arts legend. As a teenager, he got into trouble and dropped out of high school several times. He later spent a year at Emerson College in Boston studying drama. While at college, he decided that school wasn't really for him, but acting definitely was his passion. So he initially uh, stayed away from martial arts films. But then he eventually embraced his heritage. His first feature film was in 1986, titled Legacy of Rage in Hong Kong, which was in Cantonese, which was a language that he knew since childhood. Around that time, Lee appeared in Kung Fu the movie, where he played a deadly assassin, and his powerful fight scenes made impressed viewers. With his career on an upswing, Brandon Lee signed on to play Eric Draven in The Crow, which was based on the comic books of James Obar. So in the film, his character is a murdered rock musician who comes back from the dead to take his revenge on the gang that killed him and his girlfriend. Unfortunately, there were a series of mishaps during the course of shooting, uh, starting with the first day when a crew member was almost electrocuted. On the last day of his life, Brandon Lee decided to go to Wilmington's Fitness Today Health Club for a workout before heading to the uh, Carloco Studios for what promised to be a long and difficult evening of filming. According to fellow actors and crew members, Brandon looked exhausted. In the three months since the 28 year had arrived in North Carolina to star in The Crow, he, um, he, you know, his schedule was taking a toll on him. Almost all of the filming took place at night, with Lee outdoors and sometimes shirtless and barefoot in sub-freezing temperatures. The script called for so much rain, when the skies didn't cooperate, stagehands would turn on mechanical rainmakers on the shivering actors. So the stress of making the crow had thrown Lee's body clock into havoc. He would wake up at 4 in the afternoon, work all night, collapse into bed at 9 a.m., six days a week. His workouts consisted of 30 minutes on the Stairmaster and some light barbells, and that's pretty much what kept him relaxed. Don't know how that relaxes a person. Uh, Before filming that night, Brandon Lee and health club owner Lewis Davis chatted for a while about the actor's upcoming marriage to Eliza Hutton, who was a one-time story editor for Kiefer Sutherland's Stillwater Productions, uh, and she had been shuttling between L.A. and Wilmington, um, so the couple had time to spend together. Their wedding was to take place April 17th in Mexico, one week after The Crow was wrapped. In just a few more days, Lee's work would be done, and the coming week looked to be pretty easy. Uh, Pretty much he had to survive this. Well, not survive, but he, well, yes. But he pretty much had to get through tonight, and then the rest of the shoots um, were going to be scenes um, that were flashbacks of happier times for the character Lee was playing. So there was no rain, no freezing outdoor in the middle of the night. It was going to be less, uh, less death mask makeup. 
I assume you don't know what I'm talking about if you haven't seen it or don't know what the cover looks like. I'll show you a picture. We can watch it one day. Um, but the shoot awaiting Lee on the night of March 30th. March, March 30th. Are we okay? Nope. Yep. Promised to be difficult. A scene in which his character was going to be gunned down by Fun Boy, one of the Crow's villains. So after finishing his workout, Brian, uh, Brandon left the fitness today and headed to Soundstage 4. Less than 24 hours later, he was dead. Yikes. So 30 minutes after midnight on the morning of March 31st, 1993, cameras began rolling on a scene in which Lee's character, Eric, carrying a grocery bag, comes through the door and is shot several times. So Alex Proyas was an Australian music video director, and this was his first time making an American feature-length film. So he had his camera... Um, he had his cameras capturing two different angles on the scene as well as a video camera recording the action for quick playback because the playback in 1993 was not as quick as it is today. They were on celluloid. Uh, so actor Michael Massey, who played Fun Boy, was supposed to fire his 44 caliber revolver at Lee from a distance of about 15 feet, at which point Lee would... Um, he would detonate a squib, which is pretty much like a small explosive kind of thing that was planted inside the grocery, the grocery bag he was holding. That was going to, you know, um, like simulate the ripping and shredding effects of bullets. So like, you know, when you see scenes and it looks like shit's really hitting them, they're just like little explosive bitches that are going yeah. off. Uh, so as risky as it may sound, it was nothing compared to a scene that he had filmed just a week earlier where Lee had to be shot and squibbed about 50 times Squid. per take. So he had done this shit before. So the Crow special effects man, J.B. Jones, had years of experience dealing with weapons on the TV series Miami Miami Voice. This is Miami Voice, everybody. Miami Miami Voice. Pick me. I'll spin around in my chair. Uh, So the Miami Vice and stunt coordinator Jeff Amata was also on soundstage and he had attended rehearsals for the scene offering advice. However, since all the work involving semi-automatic weapons on the crow had been finished days earlier, the film's weapon specialist had already left the set. So a crew of about between 75 and 100 people looked on. Massey fired the gun and the squib in the grocery bag detonated on cue. Brandon Lee fell to the ground. Not until the scene ended and Lee failed to get up did anyone realize he had actually been shot. It didn't really appear to the people on set like anything was wrong, one eyewitness said. What the cast and the crew of The Crow saw soon enough was that Lee was bleeding profusely from the right side of his abdomen. An ambulance was called and emergency medical technicians raced to the unconscious actor and um, they brought him to the Wilmington New Hanover Regional Medical Center. He was brought there shortly after 1 a.m., just an hour after the camera started rolling. Doctors uh, discovered a silver dollar-sized entry wound in his stomach. Yikes. I feel like that's the worst place. That's fucking massive. Yeah. And then in your stomach. I don't know if that's the worst place to get shot. That's true. I don't want to get shot in my face. I don't want to get shot in my asshole. I don't want to get shot in my dick. if you get shot in your face, maybe they'll do a reconstructive surgery and you'll come out better looking. You're so right. Like, look on the bright side. I'm trying. So, um, yeah, after they found that in his stomach, they stabilized him as what they say is, quote, as best as possible. They rushed him into an operating room. Coming at the fact, as best as. You remember that part? That was the the line of the year. Mm Mm-hmm. (laughs) <laughs> Sorry. Uh, during the five hours, Brandon Lee was on the table. Surgeons tried to repair extensive vascular and intestinal damage um, that stemmed bleeding. It was so severe that eventually he was transfused 60 pints of blood, which is the equivalent to a full supply of five grown men. Uh, sir. It's so. Fine. Lee's fiance had flown to Wilmington as soon as she heard about the accident. By the time she reached the hospital, Brandon had been moved to the trauma center um, with his fiance at his side. Brandon Lee died at 1.04 p.m. According to a source, the cause of death was uh, disembodied investigatory coagulopathy. Basically, same internal hemorrhaging that it was unstoppable and it was caused by his blood's failure to clot. So it, that river just kept pouring. It was 
massive blood loss. Um, Within hours of Lee's shooting, an astonishing array of rumors circulated. Brandon Lee, it was said, was murdered by the Triads, which is a group of organized criminals with ties to the entertainment industry in Hong Kong and Taiwan, uh, who were angry at Lee because he wouldn't work in their films. Others pointed to the almost uncanny, this is fucking weird, the almost uncanny similarity between Brandon Lee's killing and a scene his father, Bruce Lee, acted in in his final film, The Game of Death, in which Bruce Lee's character, shooting a movie within a movie, gets hit with a real bullet while pretending to die of gunshot wounds. So literally what happened to Brandon, his dad acted out in a movie. So a two-decade old tabloid favorite that the idea you know that the chinese mafia had killed bruce lee as punishment for his exposure of the ancient martial arts secret on film was then attached to his son so basically what had happened was there was a prop gun that had um always with the props well i'm unsure i read two different things but it was either a prop gun had a real bullet in the chamber so when they checked it Oh, it, it didn't go. You that no. Way. Well, when you check it, just because it's empty doesn't mean the chamber isn't empty. Yeah, because it's like it revolves. Right, but the chamber is like in the gun. Oh. So like, if you it wasn't a revolver though. Oh. So this is a fear of mine because uh, I've worked on film sets before with guns. With guns, and uh, it's a big deal i mean the films granted i'm not like the ones that i worked on that had guns um are just like independent they're not hollywood well this is the protocol that i'm aware of could be different in hollywood but in my little world of the independent film world this is what we did is you know you call everybody over everybody drops what they're doing um in the safest way possible and everybody gathers around every single person who's on set every pa the director every every fucking person and usually Talk that shit yeah <laughs> thank you usually that the assistant director is the person who does this sometimes it's the prop master but they'll say like there is a gun on set it is a prop gun this is the chamber and they'll they'll like pop open the chamber and show you and they'll they'll take out the fucking um what's it called the cartridge bitch Listen to me. I don't know shit about Cartridge guns, bet. but I know shit about prop guns. And you pretty much like pass it around. You show that it's like either it's a real gun with no ammunition or it's a prop gun again with no ammunition, uh, depending on if you're having um, like rubber bullets and shit. Anyway, pretty much everybody checks it. It's a big deal. And the big thing is like there is no ammunition on set. So I was in I did one once. I was not a prop master. I was not even our art department. I was not the assistant director. Um, but I found a, uh, it was a duffel bag and I was, I forgot what the fuck I was looking for, but I found fucking ammunition in it. Nope. Mm-mm. So I pulled Mm-mm. the assistant director aside and I was just like, Hey, so-and-so who will rename on un- uh, unnamed. I was like, you know, there's ammunition on this fucking set and there's like three guns so just a heads up we should probably hide that bag so he had to like lock it in his car and he was like that's not fucking good man who brought that i don't know who brought it but that's kind of uh i know no uh big time danger no no here big time danger uh but i've never really worked with rifles or ak's or anything i've only ever worked with handguns and it's only been a few and uh most of them were guns like prop guns that are painted that um that look pretty real but yeah that's a fucking fear of mine I'm good. this is we had to learn about this in uh, i think it was for some reason my moving camera class which really didn't have much to do with this um throw a gun in there yeah why not but that shit's scary like people get when oh that just stresses me out people getting injured <laughs> i was on set for a film that an actress was on an undisclosed film that if you've ever seen Netflix, you know who she is. Uh, and she got injured. It wasn't because of a prop, but she fell like mm-hmm. while acting. Yeah. And it was a big deal because we had to film like the rest of it of her sitting down and get like stand-ins from behind to do a lot of the standing thing. Yeah, it was like bad. Like I remember the one day we went in there and we found out. I was like, oh shit. Yeah. We didn't think she was going to come. We were going to, we were like prepping to have a stand-in for her. I was like, yo, that shit ain't good. Right. How did she fall? Was it her fault? 
No. Well, no. She, like, I mean, technically, it's something. never them. Yeah. Technically, fuck that. She, I hate the. I think hole. she tripped over a light stand. Oh. But, like, she took a tumble. Oh. Um, yeah, so that's all my stuff about uh, accidents in the entertainment biz. So, like, I feel like this podcast is super joking all the time. I feel like we're never serious. I think we can get serious at some times, but I, I agree. I wanted to touch on um, mental health. I feel like a lot of people have been going through it because of the retrograde, especially. I feel like a lot of people are struggling. People are going to roll their eyes at that part. <sighs> okay. But well. pe- regardless, people are going through it everywhere. Um. Anyway, so um, I know me especially, you know, I've been feeling um, just like a roadblock. Like I'm about to be 26. I feel like I'm not where I want to be. But um, and I feel like a lot of people feel this way. Like yeah. anybody that I share it with, they're like on the same page. Right. So I just wanted to say, like, keep doing you and like things will get better. And don't let that negative shit overcome your whole life. Because if you let it, it will. Yes. I think I'm just talking to myself at this point. No, you're not. Like you, pre- you're not. You're not the only one. There's people out there listening who need to hear that shit too. But I just want. Um, I've come across a lot of, like, mental health podcasts that have also helped me. So, like, look into that. Like, you know, the world is your oyster. You have to help yourself. And I feel like if you stay positive, which is not always easy, but if you stay positive and you overcome what you what is stopping you, you're always going to win. Always. You better preach to the choir, baby. I feel like people are so scared of losing, like... You know, like, life is such, like, a win or lose type thing. But I feel like just you going out there and putting yourself out there and keep going. Right. You'll win. Get what you want and let yourself have it because you deserve it, bitch. You quoted Halloween Town. (laughs) Also, spend less time on Instagram and comparing yourself to others. I posted for the first time on Instagram in a really long time. And it was um, a picture of the little clippy dude, the... um, from member on the old microsoft word 98 yeah. and the little like, clip guy yeah so he says i actually edited it it says stop comparing your success to others and then it has a little checkbox under okay or dismiss <laughs> so you can check which box you want but that's up to you and i know it's hard for a lot of people but like i know some people who i have been um like a couple at the end of college, I remember I not jealous, but I would constantly compare where I was to where this person was. Mm -hmm. And this person I'm, well, I then became close friends with. And then to find out that they're literally doing the same fucking thing I was doing to them. They're just like, well, why aren't I doing this? Why aren't I doing? And I was like, whoa, 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 what's happening to, cause we have platforms to make it seem like, you know, our lives are great. And And some people's lives are great. Yeah. Um, but you know, people, You're highlighting the things that you want to show people, which for, you know, not everybody, but for most people isn't the bad shit. Nowadays, I I went in the bathroom and I had a mental breakdown today. You would never know that from looking at my Instagram. Do it up. That's what I'm saying. That's exactly what I'm saying. Um, And like when we are having like a kind of a resurgence of people, especially or at least on YouTube, I'm noticing that people are opening up more about this stuff and they're just like, hey, I'm having a really shitty day. Um, And it's just kind of, uh, you know, you feel alone in a world with so many fucking people where you think a lot of people have it Mm -hmm. way better off than you and that everybody else has it figured out. Nobody has it figured out. They're just honestly winging it. Everybody's winging it. You might have like a a semi idea of what's going on in your day to day. Nobody knows what's going to come. Nobody knows what's around the corner. We're all going to be dead one day. So put in the favorite thing. It's my favorite thing. And it sounds so morbid. And I'll say it again because, you know, it does sound like really emo. That's just like, oh, like what's not not what's the use. It's like, well. I feel like it's more or less like what's the use in being like comparing yourself to others to the point where you're like physically sick about something that you can't control. And it's so much fucking easier said than done. Yeah, definitely. But also it's a key to remember that these people are doing exactly what you're doing. Only putting out the good stuff. Only showing what they want you to see. Yeah. And certain people's lives that you think you want you probably don't want i give so much props to those people that like will hop on twitter or twitter's like kind of notorious for this like 
that they they explain their mental health issues or that they're having a bad day. Like I yeah, Twitter's like, your platform. I'm on YouTube. Yeah. But that's like the same Twitter thing. It's like, like definitely my platform. Yeah. Uh, so I, I remember I told myself at the beginning of this year or around the beginning of this year that I was going to stop picking up my phone so much at night because I will literally endlessly scroll and scroll, scroll and scroll. scroll and it's scroll, not scroll. like mm-hmm. I'm not really okay so here's the thing i'm not comparing myself to those other people and being like oh my god why isn't my life like that like sure i'll see like kylie buying a house at 17 and be like damn that would be nice but like i don't want her life i don't want to be a part of that shit Mm -mm, she seems really like mentally ill at the same time even when i don't think i'm doing that i feel like subconsciously i am doing it because then it's like like, why are you looking why are you so and it's yeah active and it's exactly what i'm fucking doing you've probably done it too oh yeah you're laying down in bed you're on your side if you have glasses you go ahead and pop those glasses off because you don't need no no because your fucking phone screen is so close to your goddamn face you're laying on your fucking ass you're laying on your side and you're scrolling and then you fall asleep and that's the last thing that your brain was just constant right processing before That's you're about really to fall true. asleep mm-hmm. and then you wake up feeling like shit and you don't know why because your brain was just like wow um kylie jenner just got that new uh house and i'm waking up to go to my nine to five yeah, like, yeah. and that's you know fuck it fuck it again I know it's easier said than done, and you've probably heard this a million fucking times but here's a million and one coming from the both of us Love yourself. Love yourself. You deserve it. Yeah. And tell your friends that you appreciate them. I remember where were we? You and I do it all the time because well, I really, I... really do appreciate you. Yeah. But like you'll say it and I forget who were we, we were with, but they thought it was like funny because I mean, I guess it is. Uh, people don't really say it, but I you'll mean, just be like, if I, I fuck, even if I do like a simple task. I'm like, I appreciate you. And, and I'm like, bitch, I appreciate you too. And then they like, it, they, I forget who the fuck it was. It was someone like, who laughed. Laugh. And I was just like, no, like you it's have to real. appreciate. Yeah, you appreciate the other person. Appreciate the people in your lives who do I'm shit for saying, you. I'm saying because I feel like we get so wrapped up in you know social media, um, our own lives that we forget to one check on the people we love and also let them know that we appreciate them. Why is the cat down here? I maybe left the door crack. Girl, girl. Jay, can you shake the bag of treats? Bye, girl. Go get your Bye, biscuits. girl. Go get your biscuits. Can you close that? Oh, she loves her shrimp biscuits. Cool, what a wide variety of content in today's episode. Yeah, I just... Um, we got buttholes. We got tragic deaths. And we snuck in a little mental health inspiration for you. Are we good? That's what you get here on Esoteric Oddities. And if you guys could, we're about to read our fun facts and Tweet of the Week, which you have both i only have one well fuck i'm not surprised at least you're consistent um i just want to say uh, i always do the tweet of the week but i can never find a fun fact that i actually like true so i just don't do it because i don't i don't think i should like put energy in something that i don't believe in oh there oh (laughs) there she goes cutting my own damn segment out you're gonna fucking do it next time you little bitch (laughs) (laughs) you can't uh, thank you guys to those of you who are supporting us on Patreon. If you would like to support patreon.com slash esoteric oddities. And also the algorithm for Apple and the podcast is changing again. Yes, and also, also Google. Changing. So please go uh, l- give us a review if you have not. That helps us out a lot. Even we actually just got a review on Facebook today. So thank you. Uh, it really, really helps us out a lot. If you enjoy this podcast and you have an ugly friend or a pretty friend who would like it, just, you know, word of mouth. Go ahead and tell them. Be like, hey, check check these people out. They talk about buttholes. They're just like us. Yeah. Um, Relatable. So relatable. And uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, That's five stars. (laughs) (laughs) And no less. And no less. We won't accept it. We'll send it back. So you better attach a return return address. Okay. RTS. So my fun fact is that the human brain, oh fuck, this is really ironic. The human brain remembers more negative memories than positive ones. Look at that. This is due to the negative bias the brain sets up as a defense mechanism. Mm -hmm. So thanks, brain, for getting that shit uh, already working against us. So what you got for your for your uh, tweet of the week? So to add to your fun fact, um, if you guys are looking for some inspiration, you should follow Just L Baby on Instagram. Um, it's BBY for baby. She's um, she's fun, but she's also super inspirational. So my tweet of the week is from at 
Reuters Zengri, she says, Why did the mansplainer drown in a puddle? Why? It was a well, actually. <laughs> Are you laughing for real? I'm... Yeah, I think that's funny. Did you, did you get it? Yeah, because he's mansplaining it. Yeah. Also, I fucking totally forgot. Thank you for saying that she's funny and inspirational. You're welcome. Because my tweet of the week last week that I forgot to credit was her. Oh my, God, really? Yes. That's so funny. So go follow her at J S T L B B Y. Yeah, she's great. So my tweet of the week comes from Teal Swan, and I am well aware of her controversy. So if y'all want to fight me then let's go i'm in a cult what was that sorry what was that vine it was like if you want to fight me then fight me do you ever see that no i'll show it to you go ahead okay so she says um anger is where your boundaries exist without anger you have no boundaries anger is the one saying no this is a no for me and it happened anyway so you cannot live your personal truth with no access to your anger i feel like that also works well for fear right uh, I say as I'm scared to leave my house every day. Are you? There's fucking freak accidents happen all over the damn place. That's true, but you just have to see yourself as being um, invincible and you will be. Okay, thank you. You know what? Something I really just popped into my head now that I think is going to be a new dream that I'm going to achieve. Whoa. I want to be like one of those characters on those kids shows in the full mascot outfits. Like Barney. Do you know the dude who played Barney when we were kids? He is a sex therapist. <laughs> but I don't think, I feel like people really made him. I mean, there could be totally like shit out there that I don't know about. So I'm just saying I don't know anything really about him. But I think people gave him flack because he was on a kid's show and then he became a sex therapist. But he wasn't like obsessed with sex. But who knows? He could have a scandal out there and okay, now people but, like, are unsubscribing. What's wrong with a man that wants people to have pleasure it's because he was on the kids show oh, okay that yeah because them kids wouldn't be there if it wasn't for good sex that's not what they're saying they're saying like child <gasps> predatory bullshit I get it. I get it. um i'm getting really bad heartburn and i don't know why because the last thing i ate was a pickle and before One that pickle please. maybe that pickle is giving me heartburn that's true i feel like my heart is like drenched in pickle juice click right now. off barbara i will thank you guys for listening thanks guys we appreciate you uh yes we do appreciate you and if you're listening to this when this comes out next week there will be no new episode i'm going on vacation hey bitch you deserve it it's, it's my your birthday, birthday on august 12th i'll be 26 send me nudes um happy birthdays no nudes please well it's going to be the day at, before this comes out is your birthday your birthday's on sunday this comes out that monday well send me happy belated hurry you're late my um instagram handle is um on the instagram the esoteric goddess instagram click that shit send me a dm mm -hmm. thank you tell me you appreciate me yeah just kidding and also <laughs> venmo me five dollars no cash ass cash ass us five dollars <laughs> what is that cash app oh cash ass i just cash app yeah okay i see what you did there yeah we're doing uh, a lot of rambling today. we sure are ramble gamble are okay? nope it's but i here. appreciate it anyway oh bye guys bye